Hello there, my fellow natives of Arrakis, and welcome to another episode of Dune Lore. Today we're gonna continue learning about the Fremen. Last time we talked a bit about their history and customs, as well as the factors that changed that culture and eventually destroyed it. Today though, we're gonna tone down on the philosophy and talk about some more practical aspects in the lives of the Fremen. This will go on to show, once again, how much work and thought Frank Herbert actually placed in a society that was at the end of the day fictional. Today we're gonna learn a few things about their agriculture, clothing and cooking. Unfortunately, there's very few pictures on these actual topics, so I might have to use some generic Fremen art. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Before encountering the Imperial planetologist Pardo Kynes in 10,151, the Fremen were accustomed to consuming only those fruits, vegetables and nuts that they could purchase from the village folk closest to their sieges, or much more rarely gather from the terraform planting areas or the high altitude temperate zones. All of this would change with the implementation of the planetologist's dream of transforming Arrakis into a temperate planet. As the Fremen learned to change the face of the desert with their plantings and their newly adopted imperial technology, naturally they applied that knowledge to their siege lives as well, with greater or lesser degrees of success. The earliest attempts at raising crops took place around 10,169 at Siege Tabar. Using so-called chromoplastic lined pits, or dew collectors, to help cushion the plants against the harsh desert soil, the Fremen introduced coffee, taba root, which was kind of a potato developed on Caladan, and a few varieties of vegetable adapted for the fields of Salusa secundus. Ironically, none of the vegetables that were supposed to be adapted for the Emperor's own hellhole of a prison planet actually survived to maturity on Arrakis. The coffee and the taba root, both of which the Fremen usually purchased from outsiders before, did not immediately flourish either. They did, however, provide their cultivators with a small harvest within three seasons. They took even this degree of success as an omen, as a sign that their work could go on ahead, and thus the Fremen expanded their plantings, both to multiple sieges and to multiple kinds of vegetation. Certain varieties, for example, like the date palm, refuse to grow in ground not prepared properly. In addition, any would-be farmers were burdened by secrecy, and they didn't dare indulge in the level of activity performed at the palmary sites for fear of alerting the Harkonnens to their unusual sophistication. Regardless, the Fremen persevered, rejoicing in their victories and refusing to be daunted by failures all the way until no siege was without its own supply of self-grown produce. While the cultivation of each area varied from siege to siege, certain characteristics were omnipresent. Each plant in a siege garden was prepared for eventual self-sufficiency. When their dew collectors were functioning properly, many of the mature plants could survive for up to a year without human intervention. It was, however, necessary for the gardeners to return for the plants to be successfully pollinated. The siege gardens were also cleverly concealed from casual observation, sometimes in very ingenious ways. Even Pardo Kynes was sometimes surprised of the degree of stealth his Fremen possessed on the matter. The caring for the gardens was generally left to the young children of the siege as it was considered good training for the rigors that would face them at the southern palmares. Records indicate that these kids began their chores as early as three years old, when they were taught to keep the dew collectors on new plants properly set over the spreading roots. All of the children, as well as the elders, took cultivation very, very seriously, and any neglect on the part of a young gardener was severely dealt with by his or her peers before being reported to the adults. Following Arrakis's ecological transformation, however, and maybe unfortunately, this caution and vigilance became unnecessary. Crops on the planet would eventually become as easily raised as those of any other world. 
The dress practices of the Fremen in the days of the Atreides have long been a subject of speculation, because of the strictures set against pictorial representations were widely followed. But discoveries from the Rakis Horde have answered many of the questions that so long puzzled the curious. One of the stops on the grand tour of the 10th millennium was the Great Hall of the Imperial Palace on Caitain. In this lush edifice, the splendor of the Corinos was visible to everyone. The walls of the Great Hall were covered floor to ceiling with mosaics depicting the people of the Imperium. And among them, of course, were the Fremen as well. Unfortunately, the palace burned down during an uprising early in the Jihad of Paul Atreides, and its priceless art was gone forever. Recently though, the crystal catalogued as 1-F469 has been found to contain picto-discs revealing the art treasures of the palace in all their majesty. Among these discs, outside of the occasional surviving portrait and from records of the textile trade, the keen-eyed students of clothing culture have given us a new understanding of Fremen attire. The clothing of Fremen men appears to have been brightly colored. At least clothing worn casually at home seemed to possess tones of yellow, bright green, blue, crimson, and so on. At least for the trouser and the jerkin. On festival occasions, men also added a cloak of merino wool, in natural shades of black or buff. Men's trousers were narrowly pleated at the waist, fitted closely to the leg, ending just above the ankle. Over this they wore a closely fitted jerkin or jacket, cut in a deep V to the waist, where it was held to the body by a belt of matching fabric closed by a metal buckle. The metals of the buckle were either copper, set to symbolize general health, or silver, set to add virility. In the opening on the chest, younger men wore talismans or medallions, usually decorated with a religious theme, although some commemorated an event of the Jihad. The older men often wore chains, not with medallions but small rings symbolizing the water rings they had won in battle. On their head, the older men wore a turban or a scarf, while the younger men went bareheaded. Women's clothing was similar to that of the men, except that another layer was added. Even though the men's trousers were made of a medium weight brocade weave, the women's trousers were made of a fine cotton. Those that could afford it luxuriated in trousers made from the sheer cotton of Lumar. The female jerkin, called the Jumlik, was likewise cut in a deep V, and in the earliest days appears to have been worn open. Later though, jeweled clasps closed the jacket over the breasts and at the waist. Over the trousers and the jerkin, women added a softly falling sheer gown called the entery. Just like the men, women wore heelless slippers in the house or the siege, but for fancier occasions, they chose a high-heeled boot made of soft kid skin. On the other hand, unlike the brightly colored male clothing, the clothing of the females tended to be in earthen tones, like sand, tan, or beige. It has been suggested that this was the case because they were a protective measure, because the women were the treasures of the tribe. Children dressed like their elders, except for an added garment, the tishka, which was a closely fitting shirt, usually knitted, worn under the jacket. All these articles of clothing added insulation from the sun and the drying winds of Arrakis. The fabrics chiefly used by the Fremen were cotton, almost all of it imported at considerable expense from the factories of Lumar. This came in a variety of weights and served both for clothing and decorative hangings. The best of the Lumar cottons, famously expensive, were frequently used as part of the bride price in the upper classes in which the water rings, although still valuable, meant less than they did to the desert Fremen. Wool was likewise imported, usually woven from the merino sheep of Norstrelia. Seleucan glass cloth was another spun fabric which was used to make the cheaper variant of the still suits, but only as the outer layer. Another final fabric was called alphamet, a very light and finely woven metallic cloth which accentuated the figure and embraced the skin. 
The ordinary Fremen families of the sieges lived on simple but healthy food. The donkeys that carried the family's belongings also provided milk, which in turn was made into butter, cheese and kvetch, which was a milk drink. Fruits mostly consisted of dates, figs and apricots, grown in the palmeries, and the occasional melon imported from Caladan, especially the pink-fleshed, sweet and fragrant called Paradan melon. The fruits were eaten fresh, pickled or dried. Leafy vegetables were rather rare on Arrakis. But instead, a large number of root crops, like the taba root, were available throughout the year. Meat was often roasted, either desert hare or chuka, which was a fowl, and these were the most common. They could also be made into a savory stew with roots and vegetables. The stew was served with the hearty Fremen flatbread, which also served as plate as well as food. When torn open, the surface was the plate for the stew. When the stew was gone, the gravy-soaked airtags plate was also eaten. The Fremen usually ate twice a day, a lighter meal eaten on rising at sunset, usually consisting of bread, cheese, kvetch, and some fruit or juice. No more food was eaten during the night, except for a drink of juice or coffee after arising from a nap. A more consistent supper was served at dawn. This consisted of roast or stew, vegetables, fruit, bread, coffee, and dessert. A rather famous dessert of the Fremen was a sweet honey cake called Tabara. This was a cake of a heavy, pudding-like consistency, a mix of cooked and mashed taba root, honey, and spices pressed into a dish and then sprinkled with sugar, dried seeds, and crystallized fruit. After this cooled, it was cut into tiny triangles and served with fruit and coffee. Now, believe it or not, the Dune Encyclopedia also gives you a few recipes of Fremen food. I have no idea if these are actually legit, but I did include one right here, the most basic one I thought, so that you can actually try it out if you want. The recipe is for Fremen flatbread. For it, you need 15 mg of yeast, dissolved in 120 ml of tepid water. To this, you add 450 g of flour, 5 mg of salt, 15 ml of oil, and another 240 ml of warm water, which you can add in drops as needed. Mix all these together until a smooth dough forms. This should take about 15 minutes. Place this in a greased bowl and allow it to rise until doubled in bulk. Punch it down and allow it to rise a second time. Punch it down a second time and turn out onto a rolling surface. Divide into 12 parts. Form a cake with each part and pound or roll each one flat into a circle about 15 centimeters across. Bake on hot quarry tiles, which have been preheated to about 260 or 270 degrees centigrade. The bread should be done in about 2 minutes. It will puff out while cooking and flatten as it cools. I do believe that this will result in what is usually known as pita bread. Bon appetit regardless. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these small, mundane, but interesting aspects of Fremen life for today. There's obviously a lot more lore on the Fremen, so if you guys want me to continue talking about them, just let me know. What are your thoughts on the clothing and the food of these people? Would you like to be part of a Fremen siege? Let us know in the comments below. I would also appreciate it if you supported this series which doesn't really get a lot of views, to be honest, by watching to the end, liking, sharing, and checking out the other videos of the playlist. If you want to support this series, or the channel more directly, you can also visit my Patreon page, the link for which is in the video description. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you an awesome day. May the blessings of Shai Hulud be upon you.